Time for another Don Bluth film! This time we'll be looking at one of his lesser works, the one that showed his decline as an animator and storyteller. It's the 1991 film, Rockadoodle. Well, down into the low, I was so alone. I never had no money, I had no honey to call my own. That's why I'm treasure hunting. Rockadoodle is an adaptation to a 1910 comedy play, Chanticleer. It was about an optimistic rooster who's trying to cheer up the pessimists around him, and Disney was interested in creating an adaptation to that play before deciding otherwise. So this left Don Bluth to pick up the slack, but his journey into making this movie went into development hell. He would take inspiration from some works like Who Framed Roger Rabbit and the 1939 Wizard of Oz movie. But his version of Chanticleer would also be something he just made up. No, really. As quoted in an interview, Rockadoodle is fantasy, something we just made up. Now besides Don's own studio, we have Goldcrest Films to help with the live action portions of the movie. Beyond that, the usual suspects for writing, directing, and producing are all here. So why exactly is this considered to be subpar by Don Bluth's standards? Well, let's find out. We open... In space! Where the narrator tells us about the sun coming up. But imagine for a moment, if instead of rising up like this, one morning where you lived, she took a look around and decided to go back to sleep. Then you probably have a bigger issue than just the sun not doing its job. Better call the SCP Foundation. Well, he's going to show us such a scenario after we get hit by a... SOLAR FLARE! So this is Chanticleer, voiced by Glenn Campbell. He's the popular jock whose singing voice can summon Prometheus, the living sun, but also Zeus the thundercloud, but he's not allowed to stay, so he just goes home. Of course, you know, a little rain wouldn't hurt once in a while. Helps the crops out. Now, older Don Bluth movies are no strangers to musical numbers, so Rockadoodle obviously has to have one. It's okay sounding, but I can't help but find this a bit too cheerful. Though knowing how dark these movies can get, maybe this is just bait to lull us into a false sense of security. Because living alongside Chanticleer is the Grand Duke of Owls, voiced by Christopher Plummer. He doesn't like how the rooster brings the sun out, so he's obviously going to try and get rid of him. He first tries to hire a chicken hawk, and that fails, but they do enough to stop him from singing as the sun rises up. So that's enough to prove that the main character is a fraud, or that he's not super special since the sun can come up on its own. Hey everybody, pocket doodle down! <laughs> the Grand Duke's evil plan had worked. He had turned us against our very best friend. And I guess the sun really liked his singing, since it really does just disappear after he leaves for the city. Thus, darkness fell upon the land. It's raining all the time without any hint of sunlight. Oh, hello? This the live action stuff? He likes the darkness and the rain. I'm not afraid of the dark. Right, so the live action portion is meant to represent the real world while the animated bits are part of some storybook. The former is shot in Dublin, Ireland, and while Edmund isn't played by anyone recognizable, the Little House on the Prairie actor who plays Edmund's father. The river's rising too fast. We've got to reinforce the sandbags. Oh, you think that'll work? We'll make it work. I'll get the boys. Me too. You stop right there. Oh, Mom, I'm one of the boys. Yeah, my hopes aren't too high for child actors. I mean, he definitely seems like the kind of kid who wants to hang out with his older brothers. I bet Arlo's got to help prevent a flood. We don't live in an era that pushes children to do adult work. Now go to sleep before someone chucks you into the river. I should mention that the live action and animation segments were filmed in two different aspect ratios. The animated portions were done in the open mat, 
full screen negative style, while the live action portions were in the hard matted widescreen style. Certain releases then fiddled around with these settings, which explains why some of the characters could look a little weird. That said, it could just be that I'm using a high def copy of the movie for this review. Anyway, all Edmund can do is read his book while his family fights a losing battle. Edmund had the right idea to call for Chanticleer, but he never could have guessed who was going to answer. So this is why I mentioned Wizard of Oz as an inspiration for this film. There was even a plan to shoot some parts in black and white, but now comes the Who Framed Roger Rabbit moment. Who are you? You put your finger in the Duke's face. Remember? Now these look expensive. That. Well, how is he supposed to know? You're just a fictional character from a book. Though I've seen movies where the supposed fictional world is affected by our reality, so okay, continue. But that is not why the Duke is going to eat you. Well, good luck with that. I'm sure a good swing of a bat will knock your block up. Wait, what are you doing? Wait, you have freaking magic? Okay, I guess this was what the original play was missing, a villain with magical powers. That's when the narrator dog from earlier, named Patu, tries to leap in and fend off the owl, and he's only saved by the one thing owls are afraid of, bright light. <laughs> You know, this is making me wish for the Mafia dogs from All Dogs Go to Heaven. Though I do appreciate Patu being kind to cats, even though I didn't see any on his farm. But speaking of, while Edmund isn't bothered by a talking dog, he does finally notice... Keeper! I'm all furry! Damn right you are! Yes, I know he said, I'm all furry, but... Come on, I had to. The other farm animals then show up, since this is one of the few places that isn't flooded. It's here where we are introduced to Peepers the Mouse, voiced by Sandy Duncan, and Snipes the Magpie, voiced by Eddie Deason. If the latter sounds familiar, it's because he played Mandark from Dexter's Lab, as well as the mean kid from the Polar Express. Things are still feeling hopeless, since Chanticleer isn't around to crow the sun back, on top of Edmund being all... I'm too little. Kind of shows how bad the child acting is. Well, the sun won't ever shine again, and the rain will keep coming down, and the water will get higher and higher till, till we all drown. I don't want to harp on it too much, but I do wish they found someone with a little more experience. Anyway, since Snipes reminds us that Chanticleer went to the city, Edmund is inspired to go and bring him back. It also helps that he's been there before, which is more than any of these animals can offer. But oops, the water level rose to the second floor. So all the animals that actually matter have to ride in this toy box to get to the city. Hey, I'm sure that flashlight will hold out. I mean, it's powered by Duracell batteries. It just keeps going and going and going and going. Anyway, this nasty weather is due to the Duke's grand piano. He and his owls are talk singing about what just happened. What master? A flashlight. What the horrible thing to do? What the horrible thing to do? Thing to do? But then, when my back is turned, what four-legged, flea-bitten louse comes sneaking through the window that has the nerve to bite me on the leg? We then get a drop-in from the Duke's nephew, Hunch, voiced by Charles Nelson Rayleigh, who tells the Duke about what's happening. In the meantime, Edmund and crew go past a Dairy King. Ha, but there's still plenty of obstacles in the way. On top of the Owl Brigade. The bad guys nearly drown Edmund's crew, but our heroes scare them off by using a camera. <laughs> we got him. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh -huh. Adequate pipe. <laughs> I mean, 
depending on how far that goes and how long they're stuck in the box, I don't know how long they could stay there without being suffocated. This is why Snipes starts pecking holes in the box. He's claustrophobic, and his actions cause the box to take in water. But they make it through to the end and see... Okay, they survive the fall and finally reach the city, while the Duke is making himself a skunk pie. You can see the headshot just before it's put into the oven, and it was part of a deleted scene that was removed to avoid a PG rating. Not sure why Bluth needed to do that, given that the skunk doesn't die or anything. But before the big bad can get on with his meal, his underling gives him some bad news. We sucked him into an adequate pipe. You imbecile! That's not an adequate pipe. It's an aqueduct pipe! But it was a very well-made pipe. So now Hunch has to tail the good guys in the city. But how can he do that with bright lights everywhere? Oh, say it isn't so. He wears his sunglasses at night so he can, so he can. Kill those meddling animals with ease. Meanwhile, Edmund and company are looking around in a city full of animals instead of people. Another sign of this whole thing being a dream, I guess. Edmund and company follow a lead after he helped tie Patu's shoes, and this is what they find. We couldn't find him. He's changed his name. Santa Clara is the king. The king? Ooh, you're highness. There's only one person deserving of the king title. Now even though some of the earlier songs weren't my thing, I do admit to liking the city songs. Because they're in line to songs that could be sung by Elvis Presley. Or an Elvis impersonator. I mean, that appendage on his head is a stand-in for the king's hairdo. But there's just something about the vocals and imagery that clicks here. If this movie had focused more on Chanticleer like in the original source material, I'd love to see what Don Bluth can come up with. So during the performance, we are introduced to the rooster's entourage. We have his manager, Pinky, voiced by Sorrel Brooke, a.k.a. Boss Hog from Dukes of Hazard, and there's Goldie, voiced by Ellen Green. She's a pheasant and the love interest of the movie, much like her counterpart in the original source material. They even follow similar arcs where they need to overcome their envy before falling in love with the Chanticleer character. Oh, Goldie, would you not bother me with this right now? You've got to go on in two minutes. But I'm too good for the chorus. <sighs> What's he got that I ain't got? But design-wise, Goldie has a lot of Jessica Rabbit vibes from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. But Bluth and friends decided to limit the fan service by covering her cleavage with feathers. They don't do this with the other birds in this movie, though maybe that's because they're a little bit plumper. At any rate, the Battletoads escort Chanticleer out of the building. I mean, just replace their song with this and you'll see why. According to Patu, being famous also means being lonely, and Chanticleer is so sad he still sucks his... feather thumb? At least Pinky is... kinda supportive of him, after taking his star into his giant helicopter, but it's clear that he has ulterior motives, especially with his plans to get Goldie closer to him. As for the farm animals, Seems the Duracell batteries aren't going to last long. Good thing they have spares. Edmund calls home to see if his parents came their way, but the phone gets picked up by the villains. Uh, uh, hello, uh, Kitty? <laughs> it's the Duke. I have some rather bad news, I'm afraid. <clears throat> when the batteries expire, so will your friends. 
You know, I do like some of the bits where he's being comedically cruel. He knows they're running on borrowed time, and there's nothing they can do about it. But sadly, I can't say the same for his songs. They're not very good. They're running out. They're running out. They're running out of batteries. Of batteries. <laughs> no batteries. Turns out Pinky is in cahoots with the Duke, who tells him to intercept Edmund and friends before they reach the king. Actually, he only tells them to look out for a dog, cat, bird, and mouse. He doesn't tell them what exact species or breed they are. And of course, someone is giving out penguin suits to all the animals that were banned. So guess what our heroes use? Stupid! You're so stupid! The gang plans to send Chanticleer an apology letter. But Snipes gets the attention of the bad guys by ruining his disguise. So they're now on a time limit. Meanwhile, Pinky tells Goldie about his plans of making her Chanticleer's fake girlfriend. But only after this next song. Well, down into the low, I was so alone. I never had no money, had no honey to call my own. That's why I'm treasure hunting. Why I'm treasure hunting for my love. He's treasure hunting for his love. Hey, you boys is dead meat. Are you sure it's actually them trying to get to Chanticleer? It could have been any of the other animals in penguin suits. Anyway, the crew reach Chanticleer, and they're finally in a position to give him the apology letter. Sorta. Now. She's faking it. Goldie seduces Chanticleer to get the letter away from him. Then we cut to them continuing their romance atop a skyscraper with a farmhouse. But while she is meant to be pretending, she actually does fall for him. At least that's what Patu says in narration. Trouble was, with Goldie on the scene, he wasn't feeling so lonesome for us anymore. Which was exactly the way Pinky wanted it. To the best of my knowledge, the dog's narration was added in later because test audiences couldn't follow the story without it. I don't blame them. And it's a bad sign that the movie can't explain its own plot without resorting to a narrator device. Patu also talks over some music sequences, which reduces my possible enjoyment of those parts. It just adds up to a scene with too many voices without focus. She was falling in love for real. In any case, our heroes thought they can't catch up to Chanticleer and Goldie, but Edmund hasn't given up yet. The heroes learn that those two are going to star in a movie, so Edmund sneaks into Goldie's trailer to intercept them. Here's where the Jessica Rabbit comparisons are more appropriate, even when the cleavage gets edited out. Goldie finds Edmund hiding in her trailer. She is nice enough at first to let him explain why they are trying to see Chanticleer, but then she kicks him out once he's done. Her change of heart begins when she sees Pinky's goons rounding up our heroes with the intent of hurting them. Well, more like tie them up. The person who actually tries hurting them is Hunch. And more or less, he tries to hurt them, but fails constantly. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sean Declair and Goldie move on to a movie studio to work on that film I mentioned. It's here that Goldie admits to wrongdoing and gives him the letter that the other farm animals sent him. They get caught by Pinky, who won't let them leave the set, but who cares what he says? Chanticleer uses the motorbike from the set to get the hell out of there. Just in time, too, as they reach the trailer as the gang was fighting off Hunch. Oh! Oh! oh no, no, I've killed him. Hi, oh. fellas. Ah, just throw some water on him. He'll be fine. Time to make a getaway. Our heroes take Pinky's car, but Hunch still has a handle on the side of the trailer. Time to disconnect it! Pets are climbers! Oh boy! Just climb down here and... What? I can't! Don't be such a sissy! I'll fall! You're a cat! You won't fall! I will! Oh! Do it myself! You're such a scaredy 
cat. Even if you don't believe he's a human boy, he's still a kitten. You're asking a lot out of him, and he's already done more than his fair share, but he's still got more to do because while he disconnects the trailer, he strands peepers on the other side. He then tries to reach out and rescue her, but the unfortunate happens. <laughs> I can understand this being a recreation of a small child's guilt over losing a friend, especially if he inadvertently had a hand in it. Even the imagery is a little creative, but I think it drags on a bit too long and is a teeny bit over the top. At least it leads to a cool turn as Edmund reverses course and drives all the way back to the collapsing water tower to find Peepers. But she's not here somehow. Where can she be? the hell did she end up in there? Unless she got flung into it, this just seems completely illogical. Even she would admit as such. But anyway, with everyone accounted for, it's time for them to return to the farm. And just in time too, as the flashlight there is about to go out. No, no, no! Oh yes, yes, yes. Damn you, Duracell! So the owls start plucking the poor hapless animals so they can have a banquet. But they take too damn long with their dining etiquette, and they pay the price when they're blasted by helicopter lights. Oh, I do, Al. This is Edmund. It's over for you. We got shot Of course, trouble arises when Hunch appears, yet again, and after a mid-air struggle, the helicopter comes crashing down. But that's fine. Chanticleer is here to tell the sun to rise up. Right? Well, turns out he can't crow. Because I guess he's either winded, or is still recovering from getting a pan to the head. But he can't be out of practice, right? He wasn't gone for that long. Wait, how long were you gone for? Well, before anyone could figure that out, the Duke and his cronies show up for a counterattack. I just remembered that the Big Bad has magic, and he uses it to push around our heroes. Exactly why he didn't do that earlier to get the other animals to him is a mystery. Edmund tries to rally his friends, but the Duke turns on him with his magic. Duke! Leave him alone. It's me you want, not him. So, dream over? That usually happens if you die in a dream. You wake up. Oh wait, I see him breathing. False alarm, this gets the other barn animals to keep chanting Chanticleer's name, and this royally pisses off the Duke. Okay, if he could do that this whole time, why didn't he do that sooner? Jeez, where's Hercules when you need him? Well, anyway, Chanticleer gets enough emotional support to snap out of his rut. He counters with the most epic crow ever. Does it make sense? Nope. Was it cool? No. And so the Duke gets turned into a small owl. Small enough for Hunch to get back at his abusive uncle. The floods fade, things are finally getting back to normal, and the animals gather around Edmund to see if he's okay. He's not really fine, but he does revert back to his human form. He was a little boy. Not sure what to make of that since you were both animals earlier. With all that done, the dream is finally over. Edmund wakes to the sound of his mother, and the real world also seems to be returning to normal. Of course, the window is still broken, but hey, everyone is somehow alive! Where are they? Edmund, 
Chanticleer is just a storybook. Those characters are only make-believe. Edmund's mom was right, of course, but she didn't know why. She also never knew just what stopped the rain that night. But that just goes to show you, with a little help from your friends, you can do just about anything. Except this is reality, and reality states that it was all a dream. Right? Thanks for bringing back the sun. cock a -doo. So it was all real? What the hell? Okay, let's speed run this. We get a redux to the movie's first song, and Edmund gets integrated into the cartoon world. Probably a good thing then they did this mostly animated. This doesn't exactly look good. Well, my daddy taught me how to sing, and that's why this force means everything. Sun do shine, you better shine. You better shine. Well, the sun do shine, you better shine. You better shine. So, that was quite a movie. What the hell was it even? I don't even know why Don Bluth even bothered to make allusions to the Chanticleer play, because most of the movie is not about that story. There's just too much going on, and the movie has split its attention between the Edmund parts and the Chanticleer parts. If this movie had to be redone, I suggest only focusing on the rooster and his group. Maybe tell a story about a rooster worried about his singing career in the big city before he moved on to bigger and better things. It's the sort of premise that Bluth and company can thrive in. But because they added on Edmund and the Grand Duke, the movie got needlessly complicated really fast. It could be that their attempts to cater to the kid and adult demographics respectively, but in the end, no one group was satisfied with the end product. These problems could come from the fact that there were six writers total, despite only having David Wise as a screenwriter for Rockadoodle. But that's enough speculation. In the end, I'm more disappointed with what I just saw than anything else. In any event, the movie failed big time with both the box office and critics. And until Anastasia, it was only going to get worse for Don Bluth during the 90s. A shame, given my love for cat-based media that doesn't treat them like crap. But, them's the breaks. I'm the Media Hunter. Media's my pre, and reviewing them my way. You better shine. You better shine. You better shine. You better shine. 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 Shine.